What's up everyone, it's Prop D with Ace Pants and today we're going to talk about different type of bowel obstructions, the pathophysiology behind them, how they present to us clinically, and how to effectively diagnose and manage them. So we'll start off with separating bowel obstructions into two main categories. So they're functional obstructions and mechanical obstructions. Now small bowel and large bowel obstructions fall under mechanical obstruction, whereas ileus falls under functional obstruction. Now let's talk about mechanical obstructions. There are three different types, intraluminal, intramural, and extrinsic. Intraluminal means inside the bowel wall. Intramural involves the bowel wall. Extrinsic, as the name suggests, is outside of the bowel wall. So intraluminal, inside, intramural is the bowel wall, extrinsic, outside of the bowel wall. Well, to put this into perspective, let's draw the bowel out. So intraluminal will happen here, inside the lumens, and this will most commonly be caused by foreign bodies, meconium, or gallstone ileus. For those of you who don't know what gallstone ileus is, it's basically a fistula forms between the gallstone and the small bowel, and the stones, instead of going through the common bile duct, goes straight into the small bowel. And they start gathering, usually at the terminal ileum, which is the narrowest part, and result in obstruction. Now let's talk about intramural. So intramural, as a as we talked about before, hat involves the bowel wall. This can happen with cancer, which can be the primary, meaning at the small bowel level, or it can be secondary if you metastasize from like, for example, colon cancer, GYN cancer, or anything like that. Uh, secondly, it can be caused by something like Crohn's disease, where if their inflammation is bad enough that it's, effect, uh, it's causing transmural inflammation, uh, it can cause the bowel wall to really thicken up on the inside. And if that happens, it's going to narrow down the intraluminal space and the, the food bolus is not going to be able to make it through. And this will result in obstruction. Now, lastly, we have extrinsic obstruction. Extrinsic obstruction can happen from adhesions or hernias. Hernias can be internal or external. Internal hernias usually happen with Roux and Y. Uh, surgeries, the gastric bypasses, and the external hernias happen with the defect in the abdominal wall, like uh, as we see with inguinal hernias, ventral hernias, umbilical hernias. Uh, those things can cause uh, external hernias and result in small bowel obstruction. But the most important one is adhesions. Adhesions happen from most commonly from pelvic procedures like OBGYN or, or colorectal surgeries. And what happens is when you have an extensive pelvic surgery or an open abdominal surgery, there's a lot of scar tissue that forms up in the belly over time. And this scar tissue can nick the bowel, okay? And, and we refer to them as adhesions. So what happens is, let's see you have the bowel, and you have a formation of an adhesion. So basically, this can tighten up around the bowel so much that it can obstruct the small bowel or large bowel. Okay, but most commonly it's seen with small bells. Okay, so something to keep in mind when you're asking for history, make sure you know what type of abdominal surgery they've had in the past, or if the if you're not able to get history for whatever reason, if the patient's demented, uh, or not with it, or you don't you don't have enough proper documentation, then you can always note for surgical scarring uh, when you're examining the patient. Now, in terms of the hernias, uh, let's say you have a defect in the abdominal wall. The bowel itself can slip out of that hernia, okay? And if this hernia is tight enough, it can cause it to squeeze the herniated bell, and this will result in small bowel obstruction. So anything that's going in from proximally is not going to be able to go to the herniated bell, and that will result in bowel obstruction. And this is a surgical emergency because this is incarcerated hernias if you're not able to reduce them and the patient will have to go to the operating room, okay? But the most important one out of the, all of these for mechanical obst obstruction is adhesions. It's the most common cause of small bowel obstruction, and small bowels are way more common than large bowel obstruction. But all of these can affect both the small bowel and the large bowel. Some are more common in small bowel and then the large bowel, but we'll discuss that more when we're talking about etiologies, okay? We'll go in detail as to which is more common with which type of obstruction. I hope all this makes sense so far. Now let's move on to functional obstruction. Now with functional obstruction, the main pathology here is with the motility of the bowel. And this motility we refer to as peristalsis. So in concept, there's really no obstruction. There's no physical obstruction 
but because the motility is affected and the bowels are not able to perform the peristalsis movement that it needs to push the food bolus in a forward motion, it acts as an obstruction, okay? And that's where ileus comes in. So basically there's no mechanical obstruction, but because the bowel wall is not able to move the way it's supposed to, it mimics obstruction. Under normal circumstances, peristalsis will allow the bowels to push the food bolus forward for absorption and digestion, okay? So it will appear something like this. Let's say you have food, bol food bolus right here, proximally. You're gonna have this part of the bowel go under peristalsis, meaning contraction, okay, in a sense. So it's gonna contract, it's gonna push, the food bowl is forward. Now you're gonna have something similar happen here. Now you're gonna have something similar here, and this is gonna push the food bowl is downwards. Okay, that's normal peristalsis. However, all of this is missing in ileus. Basically, the bowel is not reactive, there's no peristalsis, so you're not going to be able to push this food bolus down the GI tract. And that's how we will have obstruction, or in a sense, even pseudo obstruction, right? Because there's no mechanical, there's no real obstruction, there's nothing obstructing the food bolus going down, it's just the bowel walls are not performing their normal function. Now, what can cause this? So there are a few things. Most commonly, you'll see this post-operatively. So this can happen because the anesthesia puts the bowel to sleep, or if there's bowel surgery and there was a lot of manipulation of the bowel itself, or there's a lot of instrumentation of the bowel itself, then it can cause the bowels to go to sleep and develop ileus. Okay? Opioid use have similar effects. Electrolyte abnormalities, like low potassium, low magnesium, low sodium, low calcium, or high magnesium. All these can cause ileus. Certain medications, like calcium channel blockers, antidepressants, anticholinergics, and even spinal cord injuries, and hypothyroidism. Now, just to summarize the etiologies, guys, um, I know it can be confusing and kind of hard to remember every single etiology or every single one of these pathologies, but what helped me during PA school was is to categorize the etiologies, right? So, for this case, you can categorize into post-op, medications, electrolytes, neurological, and endocrine pathologies, right? That way, you don't have to memorize exactly every single pathology but you have an idea as to why this happened with endocrine you know thyroid hormones play a key role in gi motility so if there's something wrong with gi motility then you can all one of your differential diagnosis should be pathologies with thyroid hormones now when it comes to neurological disorders obviously the bowel wall is controlled by the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system so if there's any wrong with the wiring of the neurological system it can cause GI motility issues. So just keep that in mind. And the same go for the medications, things like opioids, calcium channel blockers, TCAs, anticholinergics, they're known to slow things down, okay, in the GI specifically. So you don't have to remember exactly each one of them, but if you know that there's certain medications that can cause ileus, when you're practicing down the line, you can always look the lump. There are tons of medications that can cause ileus. You don't have to remember every single one of them. Just know the categories. It will make it easier when you're trying to come up with differential diagnosis. There is just no way that you're going to remember every single etiology. As long as you have the categories in mind, it's going to be easy for you to maneuver around in your own head, okay? I hope that makes sense. Now, before we move on, I have a question for you guys. Why is it that the small bell and the large bell are both, both appear dilated on CAT scans and abdominal x-rays? Well, there are two reasons for that. One is because of the stool that's left behind as waste product after the food is digested. And the second reason is, is the air that's present in the bowel. Now, where does the air come from? Well, there are two sources. One is from breathing. Not all the air that we breathe in goes into the trachea. Some of it does escape into the food pipe, especially when we're eating. And not only that, there's also bacteria in the bowel that also produces air. 
okay so these are two reasons why you will see air inside the bell normally okay i'm gonna draw this air as blue mm -hmm. And there's a reason why I brought this up, because it's going to help us understand different degrees of bell obstructions. Now, to start off, there are three of them. Partial, complete, and closed loop. Let's discuss partial. So in partial bell obstruction, as the name suggests, partial of the passageway is open. So if you were to give contrast to this patient, it will make it past the obstruction point. In the same way, if air is coming in, it will be able to make it past that point. Now, this is different from complete bell obstruction. With complete bell obstruction, nothing goes past the obstruction point. So if you were to give contrast, it would not make it past the obstruction point. The air that patient's uh, breathing in would not make it past the obstruction point, and neither will the stool, okay? So none of these things are gonna make it past the obstruction point, and that's gonna make, and that's gonna make this distal bell, distal bell to the obstruction completely collapse. Because remember, there are two things that were keeping the bell open, the stool and the air. Now the stool can't pass, neither can the air, and that's gonna eventually collapse the bell when it has emptied out the air that already had previously before the obstruction, and once the patient has, you know, defecated and removed all the stool as well. It's gonna completely cause the small bell, um, I'm sorry, the bell uh, dissolution the obstruction to collapse. And the bell proximal to the obstruction is gonna be dilated. And guys, this is referred to as the transition point. Transitioning between bell that's dilated to collapsed, okay? When you see this on the CAT scan, this is indicative of complete small bell obstruction. All right, those are the key difference between partial and, and complete small bell obstruction, and that's what you should look for on the CAT scan, okay? I'm just kind of, I, I did this so you understand what I mean by transition point. Okay, or I'm sure if you have, if you've done general surgery rotation, you've gone through, you know, uh, you've seen surgeons look for transition points when they're diagnosing small bowel obstructions or, you know, large bowel obstructions. Now this brings us to the third point, closed loop bowel obstruction. So with closed loop bowel obstruction, there are two transition points. This is a surgical emergency. And the reason for that is because this person has two sets of transition points, this bell right here has no room to stretch out. Whereas in complete bell obstruction, you have all this proximal bell for it to dilate and, you know, kind of buy you time before you develop ischemia. However, that's not the case with closed loop bell obstruction because there's a segment that's being targeted right now, right? This segment right here. So this segment is just going to keep on getting dilated and dilated to the point where it's going to cut off the circulation, okay? Bowel walls have these small arteries coming in that are very, that, that collapse very easily, especially when the bowels are getting dilated. So once the, uh, once the circulation is cut off, this portion will develop bowel ischemia. And that's why the moment you notice Closed loop bowel obstruction, patient has earned a trip to the OR for exploratory laparotomy. Now, there is new practice um, where some of the surgeons might wait and see if this closed loop bowel obstruction can resolve by itself. Okay. But again, that's a decision that the surgeon has to make. But as a physician assistant, when you see a closed loop bowel obstruction, you have to bring it up and treat it as a surgical emergency. There are a lot of factors that you can look at uh, on the CAT scan to see if, you know, if there's bowel wall thickening, if the colon that's obstructed lights up with IV contrast, if there's mesenteric, um, mesenteric swirling, ascites. There are a lot of things that you can look at CAT scan to decide if the patient needs to go to the OR emergently or if whether you can stabilize the patient before taking them, okay? But that's a little more complicated and we're not going to uh, go over that in this video. But just a rule of thumb, 
Um, when you see closed loop valve obstruction, patient has to go to the OR, and that's the answer you want to pick on any of your question, okay? Uh, the reason why I just brought this up was because uh, while you're doing your rotations, there might be some times when they don't emergently take this to the OR and might wait. Um, but I don't want you to think that that's the definitive treatment and that's how every case is handled. It's done in rare cases, uh, and there are a lot of criteria that need to be met before that decision can be made, okay? Now, in terms of clinical presentation, SBOs, large bowel obstructions, and ileus will present in a very similar manner. All of them will have nausea, vomiting, obstipation, abdominal distension, abdominal pain. But the two key things that we're going to focus on are vomiting and abdominal distension. So let's split these up. So we have vomiting and distension. 